she starts wrapping it up, the interview, and then I just hear this, it was like a tsunami of booze. Like it just, it started just coming and it just kept getting louder. And I'm like, oh, might need to remind these folks one more time. <laughs> <laughs> Denny, Denny has a limited shelf life, Travis. The first 10 seconds are like, all right. And then he just keeps going on and on. It's like, all right, f*** this guy. Let's get him <laughs> off the stage. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the following is a production of Dirty Mo Media. Hey, guys. What's up? Welcome to Actions Detrimental, the Clash version, the first official race of 2024 in L.A. Something big happened this weekend. Well, first of all, we had a race. Like... When you hear this podcast out here on Monday morning, we would still be <laughs> waiting to run that race if we did not run it on Saturday night. So uh, hats off to NASCAR, Fox, and the stakeholders that uh, got together and, and made this happen. Uh, there's always going to be a winner and a loser when it comes to situations like this. Obviously, there's a lot of fans that uh, you know purchased tickets that... Uh, you know, didn't get to, they, they couldn't get to the track. You know, maybe some did, we're, you know, were local in the area and got to, uh, you know, go to the race for free. They didn't already purchase a ticket, but um, I was pretty confident and, you know, it's going to be TBD, but I was pretty confident this race was never going to happen if it did not happen Saturday. What do you know about this decision? Like, was this an easy decision for NASCAR to make? Just seeming that it was fairly unprecedented, right? To, to move it up like it just so happened that they had the time slot on fox i'm just curious yeah. from your point of view because you tweeted out that this might get moved before it was officially announced i mean we got a mole in the, <laughs> in, the in, in the camp you know we got uh we got the guy that moves mountains you know so um I, i'm sure it was not an easy decision for sure i mean it's, certainly if you try to pull back the curtain on it more than likely nascar had been meeting on this probably you know, to try to come up with contingency plans all week, right? I mean, they've got a lot to plan for. They've got, you know, a halftime performance show and how does that pivot from one day to the next? I mean, I, I don't know. There was just a lot of things. And I think that the forecast just, it just kept getting worse. It really did. Right. I mean, if you were to ask on Tuesday, Wednesday, it's, yeah, it's a 70, 80% chance of rain on Sunday. Um, and then, there was a portion of the week, well, ah, Sunday doesn't look too bad now. And then all of a sudden, this, I guess some storms come together, and it, it you know, it's just going to pour there for the next few days. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was a, it, it happened. Uh, you know, I can't, you know, I, I looked, and nobody really can come up with a time where a race had happened early, uh, a day early versus days late. Um, but certainly this is the only opportunity to get this race in, it seems. So um, they made a... They made a tough, tough decision, but in the end, you know, it was the only decision that uh, that could be made to to watch a race. When were you given a heads up about this, and did it change the way your Saturday went? Considering heat races were canceled, so the your the qualification system of getting into the race has now changed, right? It's just going to be qualifying the fastest twenty three mm -hmm. cars are going to be in the race. Does it change the way your team approached the day? Um. How did I know? I, I'm not going to reveal that part because uh, then I won't get any, uh, you know, <laughs> information. <laughs> but, um, it, you know, I, I only knew uh, 20 minutes before, um, you know, everyone else knew. Um, they, they kept it pretty tight lipped. Obviously, they had some closed doors meetings uh, when it came to this. But it didn't really change. I don't think it changed a lot for. Uh, our 11 team in particular. Um, I mean, maybe some other teams, right, you know, that don't come off the truck really well, you know, they, they're going to be scrambling, right, to try to know that they've got they got to nail this third practice to even make the race itself. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, other, so, colleague, neither, neither one of their cars made it, right? Was there any other organization that had no other cars? Everyone else had a car, right? Off RFK I, I, had both cars in the race? No, no. There was a lot of teams. I think, am, am I wrong to say 2311 and Hendrick were the only like, two organizations with all their cars? cars 
or all yeah all, all the cars. Four, have, I mean, other than JTG's single car, right? Right. So multi car teams, right? Right. So I think those were the only ones. But I mean, yeah, C Bill C Bell missing it was a huge shock. He was fast in practice. Um, you know, they I think they made a decision, as far as I understand it, to put on scuff tires. Um, the, the tires were just so interesting at that track that. It took it. It seemed like it took a few laps. When I say a few laps, like 10, 15 for them to get heat in them to run fast laps. It's very different than any other. I don't know what the combination of the the track and the tire was that took a long time to get going. Like any other racetrack, I mean, it's just we take off, we're going, and we got about three corners to nail it perfect to run a fast lap. So that track is very interesting in that aspect. Um, you, know, you see us under caution, just really keeping the tires warm as much as we can. Uh, it's why you see some of the mayhem that you see on restarts is that the tires are cold and we're just sliding all over the place. The lap times, it's it's a it's crazy. It's it's a second difference, at least a second, for like the first ten laps once we get going until something hits the switch and gets grippy and and the track starts taking um, heat. So. Um, that makes for a lot of mayhem. We did see a lot of mayhem. Um, you know, other big names that missed it. Uh, you got Chris Busher, right? Josh Berry and his new ride. Um, I'm off the cuff here. I don't have a list. Uh, uh, Austin Sendrick, Austin Dillon, Austin Dillon ran, uh, second and third, I think in the clash. Um, the previous two years didn't make it this year. Um, yeah, but it's, I mean, even to note, your former, uh, not former, uh, reigning Cup Series champion Ryan Blaney needed the provisional. He had to, to have make the, the provisional, race. right? And and a fellow Final Four driver, Christopher Bell, didn't make it, right? I mean, right. you got to think, you know, he's probably thinking, surely, the three guys that finished ahead of me in points, Ryan Blaney, you know, Kyle Larson, and William Byron, were they're fast enough? They'll be in the top twenty-two, and no matter what, I'm going to have a comfort place to fall back on certainly i mean from my perspective i thought about it during the week i'm like well i mean for one of those guys to not make the top something after heat races and last chance like surely i'll be able to get in no matter what um but yeah what i thought it did do is put a lot of pressure and build up to actual qualifying right i mean we had guys watching this watching this thing and getting bumped out, getting bumped in. Oh, you're now on the bubble. And this is the bubble that is, you cannot come back from. It's, you're going home after this. So I thought that it had a lot of merit to, you know, not everyone has to make it. I mean, I, that's just, you know, my opinion. Now, maybe this race, I don't know. I, I saw where Justin Marks tweeted, well, everyone should make the race, um, you know, if he, he had his way. I, I get that, especially in this type of, deal where the teams financially this is not a good race for the teams whatsoever if you notice the purse is you know probably like a a quarter of what a normal purse would be um it still costs the race teams the same amount of money if not more to go out to la so than it does any other points race um the strain you know other than the pit crews which they're all salaried so that doesn't matter anyway um it's just a travel of them so the you know the, the race pays a quarter of what other races do. Um, that's why you know you're you're gonna hear teams say, "Man, we just spent all this money coming out here to put on a show for you guys, and we're not even allowed to race." I I'm of the opinion though that like less is more. It's not having big names sometimes. I'm not saying not make races, but like all star races should be for all stars, right? I mean, the playoffs should be for the best. You know, if you just keep inviting everyone, it's not that prestigious anymore, right? So um, I am a definitely a fan of less is more. I thought it cleaned up the race uh, quite a bit, having less cars on it. Um, I'm not sure how many cars they had last year. About the same. No, it was, le it was less mm -hmm. this year. Definitely less cars. I'm going to say 28. Travis is on the, on the buttons. I could have sworn it was the same number. No, I, I'm pretty sure it's not. I don't know the number. I'm looking up. I can confirm it. It was less, though. I do know that. Yes, fact. definitely less cars. Because I think we, we talked about it last year. It was just, you know, you couldn't even get any 
real momentum in the race because there was just wrecks all over the place and the traffic was so bad that um, you didn't really see a whole lot of racing from that aspect. 27 drivers last year. Okay, okay. yeah, so they cut it by five, you know, four. Yeah, I, I don't... To me, this doesn't stick out because the All-Star race is the same same type of format, right? Not everyone makes the race. you got to race your way in unless you're guaranteed a spot. Yeah, but even over time, they keep... It, it got diluted, right? Well, we got a fan vote now. Now we got, you know, we're going to invite right. the I, top yeah. two of why manufacturer. Like, I, it just became diluted. And, you know, over time, like the clash itself used to be just poll winners. And so when you would win polls, it was, that was a, I remember in 2006, that was a really big deal to win a poll knowing that, bam, I got my ticket to a, I'm going to run in the clash. That's how I won the clash in 2016 and 2006. And my rookie year is that I happened to win the poll at Phoenix in one of my tryout races for Joe Gibbs Racing's cup car. Um, you know, just hit a lap, got on the pole and I knew I was full time the following season, but I was like, Oh, shit. like this is, I'm in the clash now and ended up winning. It. And so, um, I think back then it was about, 16 to 18 cars per year made the clash. Uh, that was about the number of pole winners that you had. Um, but, you know, then, you know, teams were griped that, you know, well, my sponsor is not getting shown. And, you know, eventually NASCAR just kind of went in the direction of, you know, we're just going to invite more. It's more and more and more. Um, but doesn't that make qualifying more sellable for the tele to, for the networks than to sure does do that? Sure does. Yeah, it definitely makes I. I Again, I I felt comfortable where I was at, but I was very interested to see who is who's in, who's out. I'm in the hauler, like, oh, shit, this guy's out. And then you know, you always kind of knew Blaney had a spot, but then you know, it was super intriguing. I'm sitting there watching Chris Bell. I'm like, he ain't gonna make it. Oh my gosh, right? And that's some that's a storyline. That's you know, while it's not good for them and that that program, and sure, it's a bummer for them, but. But damn, I mean, you got a you got fifteen to seventeen laps. The lights are on. Go go get it done. No, um, I'm saying go back to the old format so that qualifying throughout the year for all these races has more reason for people to watch. Absolutely, yeah, for sure, because it's an all star of the fastest pole winners. Or it used to be right now. It's just uh, the class is just if you if you got a charter, you're you're you can run it. You know, or you know, this this year though they they cut it back and says, hey, you're, we're gonna we're gonna tighten up the field a little bit. We're gonna we're gonna create it. And I thought it was a good thing. I, I just I see some pushback on social media. Of course, the pushback is gonna come from guys that had cars not make it. That's that's gonna be obvious for obvious reasons. Uh, saw Chris Rice was like, I don't like this. I don't like this. How Saturday ended up? Well, no, <laughs> of course you didn't. Um, but you know, you had a chance, you almost had a chance to have a great story too. And Josh Williams making it, I mean, it was right there on the cusp. So it just, it's one of those could have gone one way or the other for you. Right. But it just, it just didn't. Yeah. And, and you gotta remember too, is that in a perfect world, there's heat races and there's a last chance qualifier. So all these cars are getting track time. They're getting TV time under the normal format where they were going to race Saturday and then they're going to race Sunday. Mm -hmm. And because of the schedule, you know, you, some of these guys didn't make it. You weren't fast yeah. enough in qualifying. You didn't make the race. Yeah. And I think I, I thought about this a little more as well, is that you, by actually having this format where it was qualifying and then straight to the race, we, we already knew that there was only going to be 23 cars. The fact that you eliminated heat races and last chance, you know, what would really suck is tearing your car all to because you got crashed in a heat race or last chance qualifier and didn't make the race. That really sucks. So at least the you know no one left with a demolished car and didn't make the race. Like that, there's at least a little bit there. And I'm sorry if you can't get your car in the top 22. And you know if, if the 11 car didn't make the top 22 and didn't race on Saturday night, we got to look ourselves in the mirror and say we got to be better. So I mean, I, not everyone gets invited to the prom. So. Well, speaking of adding value to winning the poll, you won the poll for this race, which meant you could watch some of the drama in your rear view for the first 
handful of laps. First few laps. Yeah. <laughs> it, you know, on paper, it was a perfect weekend, you know, having the fastest in practice, uh, the pole, and then the race. But it certainly didn't play out that way. Um, we obviously had a very fast car in the short run. <laughs> and that was good. And, um, you know, I didn't, I had no indication that we were going to fight, you know, some of the handling stuff that we did in the race until the race actually happened. But yeah, we, we, uh, we were fast for the first 40 and then I kind of caught lap traffic and just dropped anchor and, and lost some spots. And then once I lose one, then it's, I open up the door for the second and then I've held up a line so long that other cars have filed in. So now second, third, fourth, fifth is all waiting in line behind my slow ass. So I, I've actually created a monster. It actually been better for me to not fight when the first car caught me and just let them go. Um, because you know, it, I would have lost less spots, lost less track track position. Um, but that's easy to say when you're in the moment and you're rewatching things. Right. But, um, but yeah, that happens at the clash is that we, you know, we really got passed twice and ended up seventh because, you know, once by Gibbs and then the second was Logano and then everyone that was following Logano. So, um, we, we made some really, really fantastic adjustments at the halftime break. I told him I needed some major adjustments uh, with the car, and it was better. It was no doubt better. Um, now, we, we definitely got fortunate with some restarts. We uh, got fortunate on, on the choose a few times where some guys chose the inside. Okay, I gained one spot by going to the outside. Usually that's a net zero or a negative after three, four laps, but I would get a good jump. Boom. A caution would come back out. I got scored in front of the car that I just jumped on the restart. So, um, that was, that was beneficial. Like I think twice. Um, and then, you know, we just had that long green flag run that went all the way up to 10 laps to go where I worked my way up to third. That was a key moment. Uh, caught Kyle Bush, uh, was running, you know, I, I hate to say I was running down the 54 and 22. They were in traffic, but I was, catching them, but I knew I was never going to get there. Uh, and so then I watched that, the wreck that happened with the one and 34, and we'll get into all the who wrecked who, who's mad at who. We'll get to that here in a minute. But I, I watched that wreck go down and it was with 10 to go. And I'm like, oh, you know, usually in these situations, it's like, you know, I, I think I've maxed out what my car's potential is. I thought that the 22... And the 12 looked really, uh, really good in the long run. 54 was good in the short run, long run, really didn't matter. He was good all around. Uh, but at that time, I'm, I'm just thinking, well, we've maxed out where we're at. And then, you know, what's going to happen? More than likely, this is going to be total chaos, which it was. And, uh, you know, really the door just opened up for me when the 54 and the 22 got together on that 10, 10 lap to go restart. Does the fact that this race is, plays out more like a sprint than a marathon of the regular season races with 500 miles and whatnot, this race is 150 laps, does that add to this drama that we're about to talk about between the handful of drivers? Because there, there's just more urgency. You have less time to make up spots, make moves on people. Yeah, I mean, you do. But, I mean, let's not – they're all just competitors. And – it doesn't matter. And, and you hear them say after the race that, you know, I don't understand why this person was knocking me out of the way for sixth place with three laps to go. Like we're not, we're not going to win. It's we're, we're, we're battling over sixth. Mm -hmm. but in the moment you're like, Oh, I just, I want to get a top five. It doesn't mean, <laughs> but like, well, it's just, you know, we're, we're just so much smarter after we take off the helmet, you know, in, in the sense of like, I probably shouldn't have done that or whatever it might have been, but we just are always battling for every spot because we think that one spot matters. And in the clash, it really doesn't. Are you sure though? Because what if you're, what if you're in sixth and you're battling guy for fifth, maybe fourth and you get those two positions and then someone spins out behind you and now you're fourth. Now you're on the second row of a restart. So really those two positions that you were battling with for fifth and sixth really well, you're, could make a difference. Well, sure. You're asking for an apocalypse of situations to work out in your favor because you think you still got a shot. I, I understand that thinking. Yeah. But I think that most people were thinking that they just want to get that one extra spot or 
you know, maybe that guy bumped them out of the way. So they're going to, they're going to up the stakes and bump them just a little bit harder. And it gets towards the end of the race. And that's just, uh, that's, that's the way they think. And that's what causes these pileups that just never really go away. So, yeah. um, I'm just asking in terms of, you know, a discussion throughout last year and the last couple of years has been, is it, are races better if they were shortened? Are races yes. too long? Is that this is a short race? Yeah. Do you see just, you know, it plays out a little well, bit different. Well, the track, the track layout plays a factor as well, right? I mean, it doesn't matter if we had a 30 lap race at, let's say, Vegas. We, we you know, we're going to get strong no matter what. Yeah. It's just that's the layout of the track, right? We're not going to get so strong at a track like the Coliseum. So, um, I, you know, it's just, it's, it's the, the track. If you look at how the tracks lay out, it's actually laid out perfectly for these just dive bomb plow into a guy because you have, anytime you have heavy braking, um, it, it gives an opportunity for the second, the person behind to charge in deeper and then use the front or the rear bumper of the car in front of them to slow down. Um, and it, it stops their momentum of the car in front and then you can kind of make a move. So, a lot of it is track layout. Some of it is the tr format itself. Um, I, I think we landed on a good format for the clash. Um, you know, with these qualifying, you know, if you had the full schedule, the heat races, the last chance, whatever. Um, I do think it should be more economically uh, beneficial for the teams. I think it should pay what a regular race should. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to hype this up as a, this is a big race it's a, it's a big race for NASCAR and the TV partners, but you know, for, for us, it, it's not, I think if you're going to put your car at risk of tearing it up, going all the way to the West coast, you certainly the need to reward, gotta be, you gotta bigger. reward the guys that the teams who invest the money to put on the show for you. And I think that, uh, that's the one thing that in my opinion needs to be cranked back up. Were you surprised how long it stayed green at the start though? So I think you went 70 laps. So, I mean, yes and no, just simply because I, I knew that less cars, while it was only four, five less cars, it just cleans it up a little bit. Like if there was four more cars on the track, I would have got the tr lap traffic at lap 25 instead of lap 40. It just, it, so no, I, I really wasn't surprised. I think I saw where the first half of the race only took 18 minutes. I mean, that's, that was quick. Yeah. <laughs> that was fast. So it's certainly and then the, second, the first 10 laps of the second yeah, part. Yeah, it yeah, it also took, took 18 took more, minutes. So. For sure. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I thought it was, I mean, everyone's going to yell bias, but I, I thought it was fine. I thought that everyone did as good as they could considering the circumstances. We had to throw a race together in five hours. I mean, that's, that's a really, really tough thing to ask, but it happened. Let's get into some of this drama that played out last night or Saturday night at the Clash. Uh, let's start with what I think is the most noteworthy, at least on social media, and that's the the beef between Ty Gibbs and Joey Logano. Yeah, man, this is a this thing is is got Denny Hamlin, Ross Chastain's written all over it, right? I mean, it's it's just brewing and it just keeps going, and the two just keep going at it. Um. I don't know. I, I, it's my job here to be as unbiased as I can. Right. And I got it. I feel like I give all drivers fair shakes. Um, it's a little bit different with, with, with Ty because, you know, he is, he is a teammate. Um, he's someone that, uh, you know, travels with me weekly. Um, but also I'm, I'm not, I, I will not be afraid to call a spade a spade if, if I see Ty doing something that is blatantly wrong. Um, where I can find, you know, where's, where it's a little bit different in this is that I don't know all the facts. Like, I I talked to Joey after the Martinsville incident, right? I, I talked to you guys on, on the show about, you know, I couldn't understand what the hell Joey was doing. He, he crashed Ty for what my... I, it would look like no apparent reason, you know? And he says, well, it's because he did this to me at, at Homestead. And then before that week, it was something else. And then I asked Ty about it. And he's like, yeah, I did. But it's because he was trying to bully me around on the track back at, I don't know, 
Kansas. I, I don't know. I'm making up a track here. I, I don't know. It was, it, and it seemed like this has just been brewing for a while, and they just can't get on the same page to call it, a, you know, call it good, right? I mean, and and I understand that, right? I mean, me and Chastain went on for quite a while um, where we just could not see eye to eye. Um, but, you know, this is just a unique situation for sure. And, you know, my unbiased opinion of the what I know and the facts that I know is that I, I feel like how how last season ended, Joey had the upper, you know, the, the, the scales were tipped in Joey's favor in the sense that the last person that got wrecked was Ty. Ty got crashed at, at Martinsville, right? So, you know, he was running third, minding his own business. I, I didn't see anything that Ty did at, at Martinsville that, that deserved him being punted into the corner and spun out and then got, you know, it crashed four or five cars pretty heavily in that. And Joey calls that. I mean, we can't argue that point whatsoever. And then going into this race, I tried to break down and I ask, actually asked you guys to help me as well. Like, tr help me find some footage of like, when are these guys near each other? Like, what instigated Joey's... This reaction. Anger and reaction afterwards to make it feel like he needed to go up into Ty, go to Ty's holler and confront him on this, right? And so I, I look at it from an unbiased perspective. Let me take the car out. Let me take my teammate out and everything. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm going to say that Ty didn't give Joey very much space. You know, he ran him up the racetrack on that 10 to go restart, the one where I was able to take the lead because of it. Now, I, I definitely feel, is it very unbiased that Ty did not intentionally do it? Ty is just trying to win his very first race. Right. And what we have seen in the past is that cars that overshoot the corner just a slight bit lock up a tire and they slide up the racetrack. I can guarantee you. Had I been in Ty's position, I couldn't keep the front tires on when I wasn't beside anybody. I would have slid up into Joey or whoever it was on the outside as well. I just, for some reason, I had locked up the tires once, and that was it. I, I just It just kept going and kept getting worse. So I think this was an absolutely inadvertent mistake on Ty's part. When I say mistake, he, he, locked, he tried to turn. He tried to hold it low. I did see Joey crowd him. He Joey left him no room on the actual racing surface. He made Ty, who is the control car. It is Ty's race to start and control. He left him no room on the entry of the corner. So when Ty goes in there on cold tires, nonetheless, and it's 10, 15 laps before these things actually get up to speed, he didn't leave the young guy, very much room for error, in my opinion. And when you, there's an old saying in iRacing saying, if you pinch, you pay. And I'm not saying Joey pinched him because I think that Joey was trying to crowd him and leave him no space whatsoever. And likely Joey's thought was that if he bangs up against my door, I'm still good. He loses rear traction. I'm going to clear him into turn three. That's, pr that's a good strategic thing that Joey is trying to do. But the negative to that is that when he did do that and then Ty makes a mistake and he slides up slightly, shoves Joey up, boom, here comes the 12 car. The 12 car hits the 22 and knocks him up further out of the lane. And now the 22's lost the race because he's he's out. Like you know, he's just got knocked back so many positions, it's pretty much done at that point. So while the 54 definitely had its faults in this incident, this particular incident, I then go back and I looked at what happened previously in the race. And I saw on a restart, the 22 shoved the 54 up the racetrack, not as far, let's be factual, not nearly as far as what the 54 shoved the 22. Again, this was the middle of the race, so of course it's not going to be as far. But he definitely didn't hold his line either. And the, the 54 held the 22 as low in the corner as the 22 held him. Later that, he, he would have slid up further anyway. Because, again, when you force someone to run on the rumble strips, you're, you, 
you're asking for trouble. You just are. You're asking for contact. And I think he wanted contact because it was going to break the momentum of the 54. He just didn't think that it was going to affect him as much as it did. And when the 54 ran him up, here comes the 12. 12 bumps him from behind. He lost not only front traction, but rear traction as well. So I thought that the 54 um, absolutely was, you know, 80% at fault uh, for the restart incident. Um, was it egregious? Absolutely not. He did not go in there and clean out the 22, in my opinion. Right. Well, certainly Ty would have rather that not happen because that opened the door for you to ultimately pass no him. No question. Right. He was trying to hold the lowest line he could because it, it did. It opened up the, the lane for me. Um, and so, you know, it, it then this boils into, you know, Joey wants to confront him afterwards. And, you know, he came over to the 54. I, I actually applaud the, uh, the the crew guys on the 54 to just let them talk. Like, they didn't try to break it up. They didn't try to pull Joey away. Like, they let them have their moment. And, and you saw where Ty was, you know, saying, hey, come on, come on in the hauler. Let's do this privately. And Joey did not want to do it. He wanted to do it right there um, on the lift gate. And so that opened it up a little bit more. So do I think this was kind of a, you know, I, I'm trying to scare you tactic? Yeah, probably. I just think that Ty wasn't going to take any <laughs> And you kind of heard it from his reaction that like, so what? Go for it. Like, and that's just a dangerous game to play on both sides, right? Because your, your season hasn't even started. And you got two guys that are angry at each other. And um, again, when both of them are just fine wrecking each other, that's not going to be good for either one. So they, they got to get it worked out somehow. And, you know, my advice, I actually said to Ty, and I said this on the podcast last year, my advice to Ty was that be the first one to extend the olive branch. If he doesn't, if he doesn't pay back that, then it's free game, right? If you're the first one, if he comes and he catches you and, at the next race, and you don't let him go, and you just race the crap out of him, you better expect you're going to get knocked around because you guys haven't settled it, and you haven't given him the opportunity. You haven't shown him that you're willing to give it a truce. But if you do do that, and you do extend the olive branch, and you do are the first one to make a, I, I'm not going to hold you up here. I'm going to go ahead and let you go, and that that should be a token of okay, you owe that back to me. You know, I was the first to do it. Now it's your turn. Um, that just hasn't happened between the two yet. And it probably needs to happen for them to get in a better place. Um, I just think that they don't, they're not going to see eye to eye on this because I think from Ty's perspective, he feels like Joey is trying to bully him around and he's not going to, he's, he's just not going to take it. So, um, and Joey sees it as, I, I don't know. It's, it's going to be, it's hard for me to see it, how Joey sees it. Um, I heard Joey's perspective when, when I talked to him last year, and I understood his perspective. I'm not saying that Joey's totally in the wrong here because you know Ty acknowledged to me that he did some not great things to Joey for a couple of races because of what Joey did to him previously. So they got to get it worked out, certainly. Uh, but certainly, I, certain, if you look at the incident itself on the track, I, I personally put 80% blame on Ty, 20 on Joey for holding him down there. And then... You know, again, I, I think Joey was trying to place a little bit too much blame on his result on the 54, where a little bit of blame could have been put on the 12 that knocked him fully out of the groove after the contact was made. So, um, I don't know. It's just uh, everyone's going to have a different opinion of it. Joey has his own microphone, and later this week we'll hear what he has to say about it. And, you know, I, I think everyone should just kind of um, – you know, listen to it and, and hear what each side has to say about it. I think we know where Ty stands on it. Um, you know, Joey, he had, did his interview as well. So they're both just upset with each other. They can't, they can't, they're going to race around each other quite a bit uh, going forward. So they, they certainly got to work it out. I hope they don't settle it. Honestly, I know. I, like, keep it going. This is the stuff we need. Yeah. This yeah. is the clash doing its job too, reigniting yeah. some storylines from last year that we forgot about. Um, a couple others from, Saturday night, we had Ricky Stenhouse and John Hunter Nemechek, and then Ricky Stenhouse and Michael McDowell. 
Yeah, so I actually saw on social media that there were four actual big like wrecks or spins or intentional spins or crashing each other after. And then, but only Fox only showed one of them um, actual on, on TV. So I, I'm looking at this collage of all these like incidences and people getting mad at each other that people were taking with their cell phones or it was a secondary camera that took it, but it never actually made the broadcast. I didn't realize the, you know, until you, know, you, you when you follow people like Bob Pockris and, and Jordan and, and Jeff and those guys, you know, they've always got these secondhand, you know, videos that, that you're seeing, Oh, that's got, why are they mad? Like someone show me the video. Like, why are they pissed? Um, and so evidently Ricky got out of his car at halftime and, and pulled the winning net down on John Hunter. And it looked like he shook his, shook the nose of his helmet. Like, cause I was looking and, and his, his, his body's kind of blocking it a little bit, but you could see John Hunter's helmet, like shaking pretty big in it in Ricky's hand was definitely in there. So it's, I don't know. I mean, it's, I don't think we were supposed to get out of our cars during halftime, but Ricky felt like it was time to do it. What's the unwritten rule on taking another driver's net down? I'm not sure. I don't, I've never done that. I've had it done to me. You've had your window net taken yeah. down by another yeah. competitor? Yeah, Kyle Petty, Dover, right? We're in the garage. He's, he, you know, he comes over to me. That's where he slaps my visor down. And then Joey Logano. That was after Bristol. Remember, he's, he's trying to come in my car. I acknowledge him. And then I just keep going. I keep taking my shit off. And I'm like, well, I'll surely talk to him as soon as I get out of the car. And then he's, you know, wanting to talk to me as I'm strapped in, helmet on and all that. I'm like, well, if we're going to fight, I, I, I got to get out of the car, right? So I don't know if there's an unwritten rule, but certainly it's not a, it's not fair. And you're not really a tough guy if you go up to someone and punch them or while they're in strapped into the car. Like that's just, that's just not, I mean, I've been in scuffles, before where um one of the parties was held down and you can't you can't throw a punch on someone when someone else is holding them like that's just that's just not a that some people say there's no rules when it comes to fighting but i i say that that's off limits like if you can't go one one v one and it, you got to have a, a buddy helping you know that's where i i kind of drew issue to you know, when me and Logano had that deal at uh, Martinsville, where the, one of his crew guys came from behind me and like did the old wrap around my neck with the leg out and pulled me backwards and threw me to the ground. Like, you know, it's it just that's not that's not like a real real fight. Like you should you should always be face to face, in my opinion. Which was which I thought like the Noah Gregson Rouse Chastain like that was a real. That was a real fight, right? Because they're face to face and, you know, <laughs> now Noah didn't see it coming, but, you know, <laughs> and unfortunately he didn't get the counter before the, the other went drop came in. But uh, I'm not sure of the unwritten rule, but certainly it's not a tough guy move to, to go, you know, to someone's car when they're strapped in. But I don't think that Ricky was really planning on, John Hunter getting out and I don't even know what they're mad about. So I can't speak to the on track incident because I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, John Hunter was really one of the last cars on the track that had made the main all race long. I didn't know how much progress he really made. So more than likely, you know, these guys were fighting for 20th or so when they were probably punting each other. So I'm not really sure. We had Ricky Stenhouse then and Michael McDowell. Uh, didn't, again, didn't see that one either. Um, you know, we, we need a, someone in, in the, in the truck, just finding out where these incidents came from. And I, and I watched the race back and all you saw was these two guys hitting each other under caution. You, I didn't see what happened in the race, but you heard McDowell say, was it McDowell? Yeah. McDowell said that, yeah, we, we talked or maybe that was Ross, McDowell and Ross. I'm not sure. There was a lot of incidents. We got a list here. 
There's an onboard of Stenhouse that looks like he just gets moved up the track by McDowell. But then when you get into the replay, uh, when it comes back to Ricky, McDowell's on the inside of him, but then Bubba's on the inside of McDowell. So you never know if these yeah. altercations start from, you know, Right. Car lengths back. Yeah. It's not necessarily the guy Great point. Him. Great point. And that's why it's so hard to retaliate against someone because, I mean, who who's to say it came from the car behind you, right? It, it's, they, you know, Clint Boyer nailed it on TV. He's like, more than likely, if someone gets spun, it's the guy from the third row back that's, that did it. Like, and, and that's what makes it so easy to do is because you can, when you're the second guy line, you're just like, I'm the middle person. It's not my fault, but I'm going to stay on the gas. Like, I'm not. I ain't going to help you. I don't mind that car spinning out. You don't help. You don't check the lineup. You just are like, eh, I'm an innocent bystander, but I ain't, I ain't going to help you out here. So that's where, that's where it's hard for me to understand a little bit of the guys that get really pissed at each other because they got spun out by this person. And it, you always, almost always can see that it, there's somebody else on that guy's bumper pushing them. So, um, I mean, go down the list, right? Then you saw the Larson and Bubba. And I, and I watched Larson's interview, and he's like, well, you know, Bubba used me up multiple times. I, he says that that was the third time. And he's like, I just reached the point where I'm like, you know, <laughs> I, I don't want to leave. I don't want to go home mad, so I'm just going to make sure I take care of this right here on the white flag lap. So he spun out Bubba, right? So, And it didn't – I didn't see Bubba comment on it, but – you know, it seems like he was just resigned to the fact that, well, I, I, I got to the five and he had enough, so he, he took care of me. So I, I think that they, that that part of it's fine. Larson got out of it what he needed to, and Bubba probably understood why, right? And then you got Reddick and Chastain, I guess, but he, Reddick had a conversation with Ty Norris that, you know, somebody was just kind of hiding behind and. I'm not sure. I can't keep up with it all. I watched the Chastain and uh, Michael McDowell one because they were racing. I was running third. This is what caused the 10 lap to go crash. Um, and Chastain came off the corner and gunned it, hit the gas, literally tank slapped, hit the wall. And then when he came off the wall, he just turned right into the right rear of McDowell. And I, I said on my radio, like, what the hell was that? Like, that, it looked worse than probably it meant to be, but Chastain was just trying to chase his car, and poor McDowell so got Mc, the crap Mc, into that. McDowell said I could hear him buzzing the tires. So yeah. I don't, I don't think he was trying to get us. I think he just made a mistake there. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, you'll take McDowell's word for it on that, right? I mean, I was, I was four foot from it. I saw the same thing as McDowell did. Chastain hit the gas way too hard, right reared it off the wall and when he but instead of keeping it up on the wall he just pulled it down and got into mcdowell's right rear so um i don't know it's everybody's mad at everybody i guess yeah job job well done for the clash if you can put on a 150 lap exhibition race you know the win is it's just a win right it doesn't mean anything it's not a points race and then leave with four to five altercations like this mm -hmm. storylines heading into the, the regular season the clash did its job are you surprised that the final restart um, when you were in the lead went as <laughs> clean as it did i was surprised but i wasn't surprised and, and i mentioned this in a few other interviews that i mean honestly if i had anyone to choose be to be behind me on a green white checkered as much as he wore the black hat for many many years like kyle bush has been probably the most fair to me i mean other than like a martin truex who never really gets into it much with with anyone who's probably the ultimate fair guy but kyle bush is just very fair when it comes to racing for wins in my opinion um and so um the reason we got into that place is you know kyle let me by uh, on that long green flag run leading up to that 10 lap to go restart uh we had ran him down from a distance back and um, so if I had anyone to choose to be behind me, it would it would be Kyle. I mean, it really would because I, I just felt like, yeah, while I, may, while I may get shoved by him, I don't think it's it would be an unfair shove. Like, I think he would try to win the race, but he is he, – I felt confident he wasn't going to take me out. 
Like he was going to at least give me a fighting chance to to race it out. Um, so, but he, he the key to the restart honestly was the launch I got. I, I think that that was the key factor because obviously I couldn't hold a straight. I couldn't keep the car on the racetrack with the left front that I'd roasted. Um, when I took the lead uh, on that ten lap to go deal. The first corner I went in was turn three, and I lit up the left front. It's so funny because Ty kept saying, "Man, you just you couldn't hit couldn't hit a mark." He's like, "You were smoking the left front." I'm like, "Ty, I never saw any smoke." To be honest with you, I I thought I felt lock up, but I it didn't affect me that much. And they even mentioned it on TV, they're like, "I mean, he's roasting it, but it's not really affecting much." It didn't like it changed. A little bit of my trajectory when I tried to hit the apex of the corner, but it it just didn't affect that. I'm just happy that the air stayed in the tire and I didn't blow all the way through it. Uh, but yeah, the, the key was the launch that I got. The gap that I got allowed me to not get punted by the eight, who was more than likely going to get shoved in the corner by whoever was behind him. 22. Oh yeah. So that was, that was <laughs> That's a, why I'm asking it. Are you surprised that it was this clean? Yeah, it, maybe yeah. it's not about Kyle not moving you, but the fact that you didn't get moved by yeah. another guy getting into Kyle. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that was all, yeah, all fair to say. I think the situation really just kind of worked out in our favor, you know, for once we, we didn't have the anvil drop on our head and we actually capitalized on a race that we, we weren't likely to win when it was, 10, 10 laps to go. So, um, but glad it did glad it worked out for us and, uh, what a great way to start for, for our team. So, um, you know, I, I said that there was really only one winner leaving this track. Right. And, and even if you're second, you know, I saw Kyle's kind of on the podium. He's just like, eh, you know, whatever I've been, I was here last year. You know, it just the clash doesn't mean much as far as correlating to other racetracks. Uh, the, the only thing it does is give momentum as far as feel good momentum, to the team that wins it, and that that's what it did for us. And you now have a trophy sitting at your yeah. front door after you just cleaned the table off 12 hours prior. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so w I mentioned it but uh, on TV. But, yeah, I, I my motivation every year is just to – I have – in the entryway of the house, I've got this just big old table, and I like to put the trophies that I win that year on that table. So when the new year starts – you know, in, any of the old accomplishments, you know, the SRX trophy, the three cup wins, the pole trophies that I got in 2023, wiped it clean. And, you know, so that table just sits there empty with nothing on it until I go out and I accomplish something. So, yes, it's very cool to be able to put something on it that's going to be there for the next year were right you, off the bat. Were you excited, eager, just curious to what uh, how the fans were going to treat you when you got out of the car? It, it was really good to start. I felt like there was a lot of cheers on the initial. Travis is not in his head. Like the initial ovation was cheers. And I was like, heck yeah. All right. <laughs> We're making new 2024. Hey, it's a new year. And then as I started talking, it got it started. Oh, Eric, yeah, it, well, of course. It, it so started. As soon as you open your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> right. I know. It's understandable. Um, it just, it got a little worse. And I, I, didn't, I didn't say anything to incite them. I was just talking about the race or something like that, or just thankful to my team or sponsors or something like that. And then I think it just happens to where it just takes a little group to boo kind of loudly. And then the others like, hell yeah, we're getting in on that too. And then it just gets, it, it just builds. Right. So it's either that, or I'm like, was there a fight on the screen that I didn't see? You know, was <laughs> what, what are they doing? And I'm like, wait a minute, they had a change of heart. In 20 seconds, they had a change of heart on me. And so, um, you know, I, I gave them the, uh, you know, all, all, you know, beat your favorite drivers again and whatnot, which, breaking news, you know, I always say that at least once in every podcast. I, I'm going to have to retire it. I'm going to retire the, uh, I beat all your favorite drivers because I got a text and those of you saw the Netflix special with my dad. Uh, he sent me a text. He says, son, you got to stop that. <laughs> he said, son, you got to stop that. I don't like it. It's just too cocky, blah, blah, blah. And, and, uh, 
I'm going to listen to dad on this one. So we're going to retire it. That's the last time. I think, you know, jokes are always funnier the first time you say it, not the second or third or whatever anyway. So we'll come up with something new um, next time around. But I beat your favorite driver. All of them uh, is officially going to go down in history books. It's done. When did you know that you were going to, because you pulled Jamie to, it, when did you know, when did it, did it just click? I was fine. I thought I was, me and, the, me and the fans, we were tight. We were, there was cheers and I was feeling them, the vibes and everything. And then all of a sudden she starts wrapping it up, the interview. And then I just hear this, it was like a tsunami of booze. Like it just, it started just coming and it just kept getting louder. And I'm like, oh. Might need to remind these folks one more time. <laughs> Denny, Denny has a limited shelf life, Travis. The first 10 seconds are like, all right. And then he just keeps going on and on. It's like, all right, f this guy. Let's get him off the stage. <laughs> exactly. That's fair to say. Um, obviously, your shoulder was feeling fine. Yep. Yeah, it's good. Uh, I got asked that question a billion times. I, I don't want to ever be asked it again. It, it hurts today. It, it does. It, it's just fatigued. It's just like anything else. You go to the gym and you do a hundred pushups. You're probably, your chest is probably going to be sore the next day. Same thing with the shoulder. You know, you're working, we work muscles in our body that just don't get worked. You can't work them in the gym. It's just, it's not, it's probably possible, but it's just, so it's, some of it is just first race back soreness as well. Um, but yeah, I, I feel good. I feel as though we're going to kind of get eased into the season. Daytona will not be a real tough one on the shoulder. There's not a whole lot of movement. If you looked at the in-car cameras, I mean, guys are really turning the wheel, ton it at the clash. So that was a little concern. But, you know, when the adrenaline gets going in the car, I feel like uh, we handled it fine. And certainly, you know, the result was there. So I didn't we're, – we're ready to move on from it. And, and this is going to be a year hopefully we stay healthy. And if I do, I'll feel really good about it. Some speculation that the NASCAR in L.A., at least at the Coliseum, has run its course. It's been three years. This was the year three. Um, if it moves on from LA next year, or the Coliseum, uh, what's, what's next for the clash in your opinion? I don't know. I mean, certainly I think that that's the chatter today, right? Is that everyone's just kind of moved on from what happened yesterday and what now, right? They want to know what now. I don't know what now, honestly, I, you know, I, I gave my opinion on the financials. I think it should pay as much as a normal race. Um, that that would make me more open to go anywhere um, as far as that's concerned. Um, I don't know. I We mentioned on the podcast last week, right, when, when you took it from Daytona, it took away from the storylines a little bit. There was always a correlation of the person that wins a clash or someone that looks strong or bleeds the clash at Daytona, they are going to be the ones to beat for the Daytona 500. Now we do not know until qualifying, like, whose car's going to be fast. And with the lack of practice that we have now for the 500, it makes even more sense to be at Daytona. But do I want to go? There's no way I want to go tear up multiple cars at 2311 financially. You know, the, the old model just doesn't work. You know, it, we, the show, it just costs too much money for us to go tear up a bunch of cars um, if it was back at Daytona, I, I don't know the answer. I saw, you know, the popular suggestion is invest in the infrastructure of the short tracks. So, you know, say you went to a short track, uh, you know, NASCAR, go spend some money on it, making sure the facility is a little bit nicer. Um, that facility gets to reap the benefits of, uh, that infrastructure upgrade for that race for many, many years after that. Um, and then you get to highlight some local short tracks. Uh, that's a, that's great in theory, but you know, you're, there's just financials there that I think NASCAR is going to be apprehensive to just spend money to help someone else out and not reap benefits from it. So I don't know whether that will work. I mean, ideally, I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is. I, I, I wish there was an easier answer to it. I would probably vote that we did not have the clash and we run more practice before the 500. That, I think that's a better use of resources. I think that is a 
better build up for the Daytona 500. Now, the negative to it is you're losing a race in an event on TV that has had two or three million viewers. So I don't know how you make up for that. And the opportunity to take your sport to a new city or a new demographic right. that you probably won't be able to do in the regular season. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, other than the all-star race, right? I mean, you could turn North Worksboro into a points paying event and do and, you know, make this the all-star, right. you know, the clash is the all-star uh, in essence. I don't know. I, I haven't had enough time to really think about it. Um, interested to see, you know, kind of where social media takes this thing uh, in the future. But surely NASCAR is not just twiddling their thumbs on it. I know Ben Kennedy's really working hard to try to get a schedule together sooner than later. Um, they've already got, you know, probably ideas of what they do with this event next. But regardless, I think everyone needs to look at LA and, you know, both thank LA for welcoming us to come there. I mean, we take a, a stadium and we tear it apart. Uh, for, for weeks, and, and then they build it back. I thought it was a huge success, no matter what, to our TV audience. It was a big bump in that. Um, and so whatever the next chapter is, if there is a next chapter, um, we'll just see what it is. This review comes from Cubbies34. Actions Detrimental feels like a real and honest take on NASCAR. Combine that with Denny's charisma, and you have one of the best podcasts out there. The show has helped me become a bigger NASCAR and specifically Denny fan than I already was. Well, appreciate that, uh, Cubbies. Uh, thank you for leaving us a review. All those reviews we do try to get uh, out here on this uh, on this podcast. So appreciate you tuning in. Um, yeah, I mean this is uh, this is what we love to do. Uh, we'd love to get this to you here. Uh, we're going to get this to you early Monday. So when you hear this, it's going to be Monday morning. Hold on a we'll get it out tonight. Oh, Travis. Oh. S Sunday night, late yeah, night. Yeah, we're taping early enough. We can get this out Sunday night. All right, right on. Perfect. So we'll be the second out. Um, the teardown is usually the first right after the race, and it's us. You'll hear DBC to follow us. Dale Jr. Download, Dirty Mo Doe on Thursdays. So make sure you're tuning in to all the Dirty Mo podcasts. Uh, and also, uh, be sure you rate, review, and follow wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, we also have a brand new YouTube page, which, Taylor, we have... A YouTube page. Will you tune into us? Yeah. You will? Okay, because you tune into a lot of other YouTube pages. So Action is Detrimental has its own YouTube page now. So Yeah. So yeah, Taylor wanted to make a little cameo uh this evening. So make sure you go to that YouTube page. Uh, we're gonna have the full video, right, Travis? Yep, that'll be up Monday. Okay, awesome. Um and make sure you subscribe to it. Um, and you'll obviously see highlights from it, shorts from it, and full, full, uh, full podcast. So we will be back next week to preview Daytona. Yeah, so quite a few topics on our list we, we, we pushed to the side uh, that we'll talk about next week. Last year, I don't think we had an episode pre-Daytona. This year, we will be back next week to discuss a handful of things going into Daytona. Taylor's going to make her, her cameo now. Yeah, I mean... Um, so yeah, so next week, like you talked about, we want to do some like, uh, predictions. Maybe we throw out some preseason predictions, put the three of us together. We'll come up with our predictions and maybe we'll have some sort of competition. Who's the most right. Yeah. Um, I probably have a little bit more of an insider track than what you guys do, but racing is as bad as unpredictable as it possibly can be. Right. So, um, if you had to guess, all right, Taylor. Tell me your 24, 2024 champion. This is a preview to next week's preview. What? You can't say my name. You can't say my name, though. Who wins the championship next year if you had to predict? As in next year? Like As in this upcoming NASCAR season. Phoenix-wise? Or just... Yes, Phoenix? they have to be part of the Final Four, and then they win that race in the championship. Who is it? I don't know why, but Chris... I'm just getting some Christopher Bell moments right now. Okay, well, there's a guy who's we been hear, in the Final I'm Four back-to-back -back -back years. Like, I think he'll have a good year this year. Uh, I think he will. I feel like this is deja vu. Did we? Were we? Did this not happen last week? She hasn't been on the podcast before. I know, but didn't... Mm -mm, I felt like... 
Man, maybe it's just, I just had a deja vu moment. I'm like, I feel like Taylor said before that she's on the Christopher Bell train. No, I said it was on the Kurt Busch train. Well, that train left the station a few years ago. <laughs> so, uh, it's okay, though. All right, so and good Taylor, news for Christopher Bell. Is that Taylor's Christopher going. Bell or Le- Joey Logano? Yeah, I mean, listen, hey, it, I, it probably wasn't. Joey probably didn't love this, this podcast, but. I gave him props last week. I do believe this is a uh, this could be a big Joey Logano resurgence here. Um, I mean, he was in contention to win, or you know, had a chance to win. He wasn't wasn't the best car the fifty four was, but I am. I'm going to be fair, and I believe that Joey's in for a big year. Okay. Um, anything else you want to say before we wrap it up? I don't know. Are you excited for school tomorrow? No, no. I'm not either. Uh, all right. Well, well, Mondays are good days for me because I have some of my favorite classes. Okay. Cool. Well, tell everyone to tune in next week. Tune in next week, y'all. We'll You'll see, see me on these YouTube shorts just like, <laughs> I don't know. Taylor wants her own podcast called. Oh, oh, I got some ideas. Okay, hold oh, up. Sorry. We're, we're, we've been trying to land this plane, folks, for about oh, a few minutes now, sorry. but we're going to. I got a note. You got to speak into the mic. Oh, I got notes. So I have like. I'm sorry, I wrote like a lot of pages. So like I was thinking NASCAR kids, like the moment or like backstage like kids or something. And like my first idea was the moment and it was going to be like what is going on at the moment, like Travis Kelsey, Taylor Swift, stuff like that. But then, <laughs> but it would be NASCAR edition, but it would be NASCAR edition. And then but my we don't have a Taylor Swift. Someone asked me that. They said, does NASCAR have a Taylor Swift? I said, um, no. I have a Taylor Swift cut out and one. Travis Kelsey. We could use one, but there's only one Taylor Swift. Wait, but here's my second thing about for backstage. I like bas- backstage a lot better, but because it says it would be about what happens at a race, like bes- like behind the scenes, like what happens on the bus, like kind of like interviewing like Owen Larson, stuff like that. And oh, I got and kind you. Of, so like, maybe you well, interview I get to other interview driver's kids. Yes. And I get to tell them, like, what do they do in their free time? Like, what do they do, like, at the bus, during the track, stuff like that, which I like a lot better. So, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we'll see if we can put that together. From what I heard and is Molly. she came into this uh, podcast studio earlier like 30 minutes with all these ideas and tr- about her making a cameo on this podcast and Travis told her get your own podcast <laughs> <laughs> well she no she said she was going to tape down here and I said you got to get your own studio you can't just use Action's Detrimental her and Molly were auditioning I wish I was recording it they were talking for like 20 minutes I mean credit to her she came down here to create her own podcast Travis said get your own podcast and 30 minutes later she came up with a bunch of ideas no 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 uh, Taylor who gave you the idea of interviewing kids Mm. You're welcome. Uh, all right. There we go. And Molly was like, because we were rem- we were on the like on the headphones. Molly was like, re- we were remaking the like thing <laughs> of the sugar thing, mm. like you know, with Lacey Caroline. She's like, Coca Cola sugar, like stuff like that. And we were remaking it. Okay, so, land the plane. Okay, tune in, y'all, next week. We'll see ya. See you. Bye, y'all. You know when you kind of digest. This whole Chastain Larson thing, you definitely have to go back earlier 